And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of Bond, creator of Bond of the Blade, and so and soon the spi and soon the Spider's Web. The former being the former available on Tapas right now. The one and only, the <laughs> my my brother in shit posting. The the man known as Anime Sparks. How you doing today, man? Hey, what's up, Meldrum, man? Thanks for having me on. Um, real quick, I do just want to make a slight uh, correction there. the The second title is the Spider's Circle. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know why. I, I don't know why I said it like that. Um, I mean, it's fine. It's webs all in the the titles mm -hmm. thingy, but so that's probably where it come from. But yeah, the Spider Circle and Bond of the Blade. You yeah. got that one right, though. Yeah. Um. But we, but. It's a bit of a, a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings. So, I'd like you to walk me through where the where um you um where you started getting the right the writing bug in a sense. Uh, all right. Uh, just in general, not for either particular story. Just in general, we'll get we'll get to the we'll get to the particular story it in a bit. All right, no problem. Uh, well, basically, I have been a lover of storytelling and as an art form and as a means of entertainment and just a way of bonding with people since I was little. Um, I have distinct memories of, like, obviously, you know, my, my mom and to a lesser extent my dad reading me stories and... I would always love to dive in and become characters. You know, I've loved acting and performing since I was in elementary school. And so I've just been soaking in all these different stories and all these different from from different cultures, uh, different mediums for my entire 32 years of life. And as I got into adulthood, my mind just naturally started to see the world through those lenses. Now, sometimes that would be through a particularly colored lens, like, say, a video game style story or an anime or mm -hmm. an action movie style story. But I was always seeing my life and thinking about things that happened to me and world events that I knew of in terms of storytelling, character progression, plot, this, that, and the third. And by the time I was close to 30, I was like, you know what, man? I have, like, this whole library which is in my head, and I practically have my own cast of characters now. Excuse me. Why don't I do something with them? You know, for a while I was doing my thing on the uh, um, on fanfiction.net, writing Steven Universe fanfiction and st shit like that. I was, I don't know if you ever played the game Rocket Knight Adventures. I have. Um, yes, you know, my boy Sparkster, let's go. Um, but, have you yeah. Did you play the sequels? Oh yeah, I uh, really enough. I played the second one first because um, I was a kid, and they didn't. Uh, I'm sure you know they didn't label none of the games like on the boxes. At least not with the Genesis versions. I don't think it just said Sparkster. So I'm sitting here thinking that's the first one. So I take it home, buy it, and then um, it says on the title screen, Rocket Knight Adventures 2. So it was years before I even played the the first game. But yeah, that's. That's legit, like, my favorite uh, Sega Genesis level, uh, Sega Genesis era of video game title is uh, all the Sparks or shit. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was writing some fan fictions for that, and uh, basically because I really wasn't super passionate about either story, even though I, I did care to an extent, I didn't really push them that hard. But one day I was just thinking, I'm like, man... I got these stories in my head, these original characters I made up, and I'm sitting here spending my free time writing fan fiction that even if it does blow up, I can't do anything with it. Why don't I just give the same attention to my own stuff? And so I started developing the characters more. Um, I started, I, I can't draw worth a shit. If you ever see a, a, a perfectly drawn circle, you know anime didn't draw it. But... <laughs> You know, like, I would sit here and I would think of, you know, how would they look? And I would often use visual references from characters or real-life figures 
article random articles of clothing to be like okay well she would wear her hair like this his sword would look like this and i didn't have any visual representation yet but by the end of last year mm -hmm. i had for bond of the blade alone i had about four major story arcs a prequel series and the potential for a spinoff uh the skeleton for all of those done before I even drew, had a single character drawn. And I'm sitting there like, I have to do this. And at first, it was all going to be uh, prose. Um, but I was talking to some personal friends about these stories. And they were like, anime, man, this stuff is so good. Like, all right, so when the first episode dropping? When you when we going to play the game for this? And I'm like, no, nah, this this is just novels. And I'm like, oh, well, I mean, okay. But, like, I really want to see this stuff done. And then I made the, the deadly mistake of having my, some of my characters drawn. The first one was Foxy Phoenix from Bond of the Blade. Mm -hmm. um, just for, uh, I don't know if you've seen a whole lot of her, but just describe her a little bit for your uh, listeners. She's, um, think of a, a slightly chubby magical girl who's very fun, but has a little bit of an edge and likes to flirt a lot. Mm -hmm. So like if you merged uh, Tim Bruce's Harley Quinn and uh, She-Hulk. Um, that's essentially the the style of character that she's in. Uh, just give like a little with a little bit of magical girl flair up there. Right. Um, but I had her drawn, and I'm like, I need more of this. And then I met the guy who would become the um the official artist for Bond of the Blade, a a great guy by the name of Go Ichimonji on Twitter, and he did some pieces for Catherine Scarlet and Endora from the Spider Circle, and I'm like. Well, these are just absolutely insane. I just have to keep doing more. And then he drew more. He drew Ashira. He drew Terry, Mickey, just down the list. And before you know it, I'm like, uh, yeah, man, I'm just going to have to make these some comics. I'm going to have to save me some money because um, these, those, these just need to be drawn. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was one of those things where you, you know how when you make a character and you get to know them so well that you're not even writing them anymore. It's more just like you're watching them do stuff and just recreating it on the paper. Hmm. Like, I reached that point with my characters. And um, seeing them visually only made that just so much stronger. Yeah. Um, excuse me. You're excused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, go ahead. When, now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind... Um, Obvious, obviously, uh, everybody's um, everybody's cre everybody's creative and everybody's creative work is a pro is a product of their influences and a product of their inspirations. And the, and seeing mm -hmm. the chain of events is always something that's going to be interesting to me. Um, with that with that kind of thing in mind, I'd be I'd be curious some I'd be curious some of the things that served as inspiration for you when it came to um, Bond Bond of the Blade. Okay, well, funny enough, um, you know how folks in our little sphere of, of Twitter and creativity, they rag so much on self-inserts, and, you know, self-inserts are just, they're the devil, they're everything, and then I'm not the biggest fan of them myself. Uh, that's mainly due to execution, you know, because you see a lot of folks now, especially in the, the bigger name people, where everything is a self-insert, and it's like the laziest self-insert ever. Mm -hmm. Like, no effort to distinguish them as their own character. That's odd, because technically, Terry from the uh, from Bond of the Blade is a self-insert of me. At least that's how he started. Mm -hmm. You know, for, like I said, um, I, I reached a point where everything I saw would be translated into my mind as some type of story. And Terry just became how I saw myself in my head. And so I would make him in video games and stuff. And then eventually when I made him as actual character, Terry Gallen, a.k.a. Shen, uh, that's who he was. But as I began to develop him, I started to change things so that he would be his own character, not just self-insert. But um, Bond of the Blade, you were asking what a lot of my inspirations was for it. A lot of it comes from things that I've experienced um, in life and even sort of a recreations of how I imagine things or things that I went through. Mm -hmm. Um you still there? Uh, my I'm screen still, just went blank. I'm still here. I'm just making sure that stuff's not crazy. Okay, my fault. My fault. 
But yeah, I'm back. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, let's make sure I didn't have a power outage or something. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I have so many inspirations from um, just things that I've been experiencing in life from time my time in the church to um, video games, uh, martial arts movies. Like, I love martial arts. Like Bruce Lee, the, like out of all the people that I admire from the past, he's like in the top three where I'm like, yo, if you could just bring him back for one day. And I could just have a conversation with this man. Gotta be Bruce Lee in there, man. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it also even goes to things like, um, oddly enough, things like the civil rights movement and um, the different periods of history. Bond of the Blade is sort of my love letter to everything that's mattered to me in some way or another in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and that'll make much more sense as the story gets more fleshed out. But things from like um, ancient mythology, um, and I've talked to some people about uh, Ashira because you know Ashira is the angelic spirit that uh, gives the the heretics, those are the good guys in Bond of the Blade. Mm-hmm. She gives them their powers, and a lot of her story, when I read it back, like her backstory, it reads just like that those old mythology stories. Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting here reading, and I'm like, oh, man, I wasn't even necessarily trying to make it like that. But since it's going in that direction, let me go ahead and sprinkle in some of, the, some of this uh, here and there to just to make it really stand out like that the type of uh, that type of myth, that legend story, man. And just uh, like I was saying earlier, as someone who's loved storytelling so much, it doesn't matter if it was a story told in 3000 BCE or... Or if I heard it on the radio yesterday, mm-hmm. like if it matters to me, if it influences me, I'm going to draw from it. I'm going to draw from those cut scenes from NES back when my mind was blown. Like, oh, you can put this in video games. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm going to draw from those comic pages, those early comic book movies back before the MCU was a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to draw from when I used to sit and watch Cowboy Bebop and stay up way past my bedtime and threaten and get threatened and cussed out by my mama because I got school tomorrow. What am I still doing up? Mm-hmm. Like, mama, Spike's about to go fight Vicious. I gotta watch this. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. But that stuff, man, I just, drawing from everything and having inspiration come from so many different places, even something like music. Mm-hmm. Like, some people may not think that um, music can inspire a person when it comes to writing, but I'm here to tell y'all. Oh my anybody, anybody who God. says that, have you ever? I have two words for you: concept album. Come on, man, talk, talk to these people. But they, some people are really surprised when they hear that folks get inspiration from music. They listen to this stuff and it informs them. It it helps paint the picture. There have been whole chapters, whole characters, even that would not exist the way they do today if I didn't hear a piece of music when I heard it in the mind state that I was in when I heard it. Yeah. But all those things happened, and here we are. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's beautiful, man. One one particular thing that I'm that I'm curious about if if this was an influence to you was um so, was some of the some of the comics that were really that were really making headway um, in the '90s. The era that's the era that some historians refer to as the Dark Age, and I refer to as the Iron Age. Um, <laughs> the Dark Age, okay. Um, I just i i prefer i prefer calling it the Iron Age because all the because all the other eight all the other comic ages um, are referencing me, are referencing metals in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got the gold and silver and all that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. Um, I mean you. The and the result, I mean, of course, the of course the big one in this kind in this kind of thing is is stuff like Spawn, stuff stuff like um stuff like the Punisher, which was ridiculously overexposed at that time. Um, True. <laughs> a lot, a lot of a lot of a lot of very urban stuff. Um, um, I have to count Night Thrasher because that was the fir- that was the first comic I actually bought. Um. Yeah, a lot, a lot of a lot of it is a lot of it is the is basically the coming out party for these street level um, characters that were in that were on the indies and um, in yeah. Mar- in Marvel especially. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, 
I, I would say that um, a little bit, probably not super directly influenced because I wasn't that big of a comic head back in the day. Mm -hmm. I did read them very off and on, but uh, as I often say in my videos, I'm an 80s baby, 90s kid. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I my neighborhood didn't have a super bustling comic uh, shop or anything, and so I basically read like hand-me-downs from older cousins which is how I first met Iron Man mm -hmm. before I would then turn to Fox Kids and his cartoon would be on. And that's how I met most of the superheroes was through the cartoons. Mm -hmm. But thinking back to a lot of those properties, they I do see how a lot of that stuff did influence me because that's, you are right, that's definitely a take I'm using with this first um, arc or saga of Bond of the Blade where they are much more street level fighting gangs and organized crime some superpowers some uh supernatural elements in there but it's much more grounded mm -hmm. um i talked to um to hero geek um on what and his show a while ago and he made a connection to the ninja turtles and, and i'm like uh yeah that's 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 almost spot on there's definitely some ninja turtle references in there even when you look at uh the team breakdown and kind of how they interact when they're on the field that there's definitely that that sense of that urban hero and that um the quote unquote dark age, but I'm going to try and call it more now the Iron Age. I, I definitely like that phrase much more than the the dark age. Like, I mean, come on, man, come on. Oh Nin yes, nineties were... comics they, they they get a bad rap, but let, let's be real here. Like there there was some but some bangers in the nineties. Yeah. Um. And gr granted, granted, I often I often hear about how I often hear about how terrible the nineties is from a, from people who. Um, grew up in the '80s, and I've mm -hmm. I've made I've made it I've made it clear over the years. Um, I'm I'm sick I'm sick of pe I'm sick of people tell telling me how telling me how great um their particular um time period was, not not yeah. to dis not to dismiss good things that came that came out of it, but it's more but it's more of if you're if um if you've got if you you if you've got your if you get up if you get your head up in the clouds, um. All that's all. Then all you're get all you're gonna see is just is just air. Um, you damn right. <laughs> you damn right, man. Um, one thing one thing that um one thing that struck me when I look at the when I look at the team that you ha that you have is uh, is um going for going a bit unorthodox with the set with the weapon setup. I mean you've got you've got one. On one end, you have what you have what is very reminiscent of a um, Chinese Jian. Um, mm -hmm. On one on one other end, you have you have a pair you have a pair of Tanfa, and on one mm -hmm. more end, you have um, a uh, Sunset's cone. Yep. Um, for those unaware, a th a three section staff. Um, you are correct. So, would it be fair of me to say that you ended up doing a lot that you ended up doing a fair bit of research when it came to D different type, different types of historical weapons and the like. I did, um, and now I, I will also preface what I'm about to say with the fact that um, I am a relative pleb when it comes to a lot of this stuff. So, for you and any other readers out there, if you see something that's woefully inaccurate to the point where it breaks immersion, just let me know. It's most likely something I can tweak, mm -hmm. um, but I, I definitely do want to have somewhat of a re um, of a uh, accurate representation of different martial arts forms, um, both um, weapon and uh, just with hand to hand combat. And I wanted to incorporate weapons that aren't used a whole lot. I've seen a couple things people where people use Tanfa. I've never really seen anything outside of like straight up martial arts movies where people use the staff. Most people either use the long, more bow staff type, or they do nunchucks. Mm -hmm. I really haven't seen three section staff used, so I thought that that would be uh, something interesting that I could implement there. Yeah. And I also chose those weapons more because I wanted to drive home the fact that they're largely, they're not trying to kill people. Like, mm -hmm. even Terry with his sword, or Shen, whichever word name you want to call him, mm -hmm. um, he's sort of, I haven't put this in a, uh, a chapter yet, but I can sort of just, just uh, throw this out there. Um, he, the energy, the aura that surrounds him and his sword, it is intentionally non-lethal. 
So even though the bear sword itself could be used to kill, in 90 to 95 percent of circumstances, it's not going to because it keeps the edge from being able to uh, pierce the skin to the point to where he could like skewer organs. But that's him. The other two, in order to not even get to where that could be possible, they just use the blunt weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, so there there are a couple different reasons why I chose those weapons there. But just like I said, as as someone who loves martial arts and who's loved martial arts culture, martial arts movies, and um, all types of different properties, I felt like it was very it was necessary for me to implement these 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 yeah. weapons in this way and sort of just go off the beaten path a bit. Yeah, I bring up this kind of thing because something that I think I think a lot of writers um, overlook. Especially even even writers when it comes to action when it comes to action works is is how the is how the fighting style of a given character can inform just as much about their about their um, personality or their or their character as anything else. Um, mm, yes, yes, a, I love stuff like that. A um, I'll use for, as a case in point for this kind of thing. I'll use um, I'll use Star Wars as an example simply because. Everybody's familiar with Star Wars on one form or another. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that was kind of developed through the EU is the idea of, of lightsaber forms. Not in terms of physical form, but in terms of um, fighting, st fighting styles and fighting approaches. Um, officially, there are seven of them. And mm -hmm. oftentimes characters will dip into, se into several of them, but they'll, ha but they'll um, have, have one that's kind of that's their fallback. Um, Count Dooku, for instance, used Form Two, known as known as um, Makashi, which is which is very much akin to fencing. It's very um, it's very par very parry and riposte, economy of motion, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, Yoda, to compensate for his small size, used Form Four, um, which is called Ataru, which is of, is very acrobatics um, focused. Yeah, they they go out and flips and <laughs> hopping off walls and yeah. shit from the, from the prequels. Yeah. Um. Va um. Vader used for, used um form five, which um, which which can be either known as Xian or Gem So. It's complicated, but it's but it's. Very much reflective of um, ke of kendo or bro or broadsword fencing, where you're trying to match power with power instead of trying yeah, to divert. I was I was just about to say broadsword, and I'm not even a uh, weird weird tangent, but I actually used to study uh, martial arts from the perspective of lightsaber dueling. Like it was a legit light sword martial arts, and they would reference all those forms. In the actual forms that we studied, I only made it up to form two, and before I had to end up leaving because of uh, financial reasons and coof. But I definitely remember going through those forms, and I'm like, "Oh, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense." And even just thinking about the way Darth Vader fights, it's very heavy. It's so power intensive. Like I could see him, like if these were physical swords. I couldn't see him holding anything other than a broadsword. Um, I've I've seen I've seen some uh, I've seen some like I've seen some other interpretations like like say taking 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 Vader or stormtroopers and and putting them in in say um your say European style armor or samurai armor. Um, mm -hmm. there was one, there was one case that was that was going for that was going for more um more Euro more um European um. Arm, armor more specifically around specifically around Germany that had him um, wielding a Zweihander. Um, I hadn't seen that. Um, I've it was it was clearly it was clearly inspired by um, by Pike by more by more of the Hundred Years War er, era in e in Eastern Europe to the point that he almost looked like a, a Landschecht, which okay. I know I'm mispronouncing, but <laughs> but that's a hard <laughs> word to go with. Um, but a lot, but, um, when you really, when you really stop and think about it, a lot of people, I don't think they realize how terrifying it is 
to get to get into a sword fight with someone whose arms and legs cannot tire. Yeah. <laughs> you count up shit's creek. Which is which is why there's that style because even even if his attacks can be blocked, it's it's less about um it's less about tr about trying to avoid blocks and more about just breaking them. Cuz yeah, they're mm -hmm. going to keep blocking, but you're but blocking doesn't doesn't mean that all that all that inertia just stops. Yeah, <laughs> that is just like you you you'd have a better chance of uh, tanking some shots from a sledgehammer than just sitting there just just block block. Like what what are you doing? Yeah. What are you, what are you... Um, of course um, uh, Mace Win Mace Windu had a variant of Form Seven, which um was all, was. The original form of the original form seven was Juyo, which was all about channeling one's passions, and thus was um, banned. But he created a variant of it where he was where he was drawing upon his opponent's passions and turning that against them. Um, wow, that's fascinating as all hell. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to look more into that. Yeah, it's it's called his version is called Vapad or the Way of the Vornsker. Um and. Its movements are its movements can appear random, but have a lot more con a lot more control. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was, and that's the reason why they, for the in, at least in universe for the whole purple lightsaber thing, because he was the only one who was able to figure that out, and no, and nobody could study um, nobody could study the pod without his permission. Wow. Um. Even even my ass sitting here learning something new about Star Wars. Um, <laughs> I I seem I seem to be able to bring that out of people that ev everybody who everybody who comes to who comes to my temple ends up learning something new. Um, hey man, look, we in a temple. If we ain't learning and we ain't vibing, what are we here for? Yeah. Um. But with now. Within these within these setups, since um, Bond of the Blade is t takes place in um, in Union City, some mm -hmm. some auth some authors will cr will create the world first and then create the characters, while some will create the characters and the and then the world. Um, I recently had Richard Kemp on, who was very much a example example of the latter. Um, where would where would you say that you fell into when it came to that paradigm? Um, I would definitely call myself a character-driven writer in general. Um, pretty much every story I do starts with the characters. And depending on how I imagine the characters, what I have them doing, how they interact, that informs how I frame the world around them. Hmm. Now, I sort of cheated for Bond of the Blade... Because a lot of Union City is just drawn inspiration from Hampton Roads, Virginia, which is the area I was raised in. <laughs> but specific aspects of it are definitely going to be played up more depending on how I envision the characters um, interacting and behaving. So it, if anyone who grew up here or lives here looks there and is like, hey, this part won't there. Well, it's like that for a reason. Just keep reading. To be f to, yeah. to play, to play yeah. devil's advocate with that, it's not as it's that kind of thing is not as uncommon as pe as people might think. Um, I'm a big fan of John of John Sanford's Prey series of novels, and there's a there's a lot as and um he because of the fact that the character that for the longest time, um, the central character in that Lucas Davenport was a was a, a detective with with uh, with the St. Paul Police Department. Um, there's a lot of references to the to the Twin Cities. Um, yeah. And to use another example, you've I'm I'm pretty sure you've played at least the first Max Payne, haven't you? Uh, yes. Good Lord! <laughs> now I'm sitting here thinking how long ago that was. Um. Oh, yes, I'm familiar with. When it when it came to when it came to the when it came to the background when it came to the background photos and just the photos in general, um, they actually they actually went to various parts of New York City to take those photos. Um, oh, okay. And a lot a lot of the pe a lot of the people in the photos were ju were ju were just um <laughs> were were just people were just people on staff or their, or friends or family and. 
um, <laughs> Max himself being portray being portrayed by by um, the head by the head of Remedy, um, Sam Lake, um, which is the reason why you have such um, very trying expressions for that first game, because you had a bunch of people who do who weren't exactly actors. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, but yeah, no, that that is good. I I do like hearing that. Um, I mean, I I knew of it in I guess in the back of my mind, but it's always good to hear the real life inspirations that people use for their fictional settings. Like I mean, I mean, we the the phrase "There's nothing new under the sun" isn't well known because it's bullshit. Like legit, everything we write or draw or whatever comes from somewhere, and why not draw from uh, real life things that are uh, iconic and impactful. If yeah. it, if you use those elements to create something new, then you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of a lot of times when it, in in series that ha that go, that go with um, that go with three central characters, there's a bit of a tendency to have a have a kind of id ego super ego um, relation relationship between between the three. Um, mm -hmm. is, is that, so, is that something that you drew, that you drew upon when it came to the personas of, of your three central characters? Mm. Not explicitly. Um, if I were to read, uh, let's say for example, not this chapter that's being, um, updated right now, but the chapter after this, where for the first time we'll see all three of the heretics on uh, the page on panels together, it does end up becoming like that because it's it's kind of an easy trope to fall into when you just have those three um, core team members. It's it's sort of an, in my opinion, it's sort of easy to fall into the trope of having one who's like this and one who's like this, and then one who's a bit more either the voice of reason or a bit in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to describe the three of them together. More accurately, let me see if I can say this without jacking the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. um, there's Terry, the leader. He would be, I guess you could say he's the head. Mm -hmm. um, Michaela or Chance, he's more of the heart. And then Will is uh, more of the muscle. And I know that's a very lazy way to phrase it. But I guess instead of thinking it in terms of it, ego, superhero, I thought more of their, um, I guess, their overall role in the, the team dynamic. If that makes any sense. Well, um, just uh, just out of just out of um, cur just out of curiosity, are you from are you familiar with the concept of id ego and super ego? Uh, I am. I was a psych major in college, which I graduated from in 2011. So I may have some aspects a little fuzzy, but if I remember correctly, and feel free to correct me after I fuck all this up, <laughs> but your id is more of your instincts. Mm -hmm. Your ego is more logic driven, and the super ego is more. Not emotion, but more like like your your logic, but also with compassion in there as well. The um, it's the balancing I, act. Balance. There you go. Yep. Mm -hmm. How how far off base am I? Am I like was I was I aiming for New Jersey and ended up in in uh, Wisconsin? Um. No, you no, you were fair, you're on point and for and for and um, fortunate because if you ended up ended up in Wisconsin, you'd probably get pulled over for sub, for sobriety. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> You get you get pulled over and ticketed for having a blood alcohol limit that's too low. It's too low. <laughs> I need more, you gotta get more drinks in you, man. <laughs> All right, but yeah, okay, <laughs> good, good I've, to know. But good to know. When now, when I real now I realize that um, the spider circle, which I which I do want to I do want to shift over to, is sure. cur is currently in development, but. Mm -hmm. When it came to when it came to that one was did did the idea for the spider circle um start start from the start from this notion of a a ma a magical counterpart to the more mar to the more martial aspects of Bond of the Blade? Yes and no. Um weirdly enough the spider circle um was born because I was playing this game 
Um, I think I don't even remember that. It's like Spellbound or Spellbreak, one of them fleet free to play games. That was on PlayStation Store. My one friend was like, "I want to play some." Excuse me, I want to play something new. Might have been sp it. Might have been Spellbreak, but um... yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure it was Spellbreak. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I was playing that, and I really liked the skin that I was using for my my avatar this one time, and I liked her so much. I was like, man. I wonder if she was a real character, she'd do this and she'd do this. And I loved the game because it felt like a shooter, but it was with magic. Mm -hmm. So they, they had the gauntlets and they would shoot all these different spells, which is honestly why most of the characters in the Spider Circle have gauntlets. That's directly where I got the idea from. Mm -hmm. But I saw that and then that ended up, I started thinking about, oh, well, if she exists, what would her personality be like? What would her name be? And then I was like, well, I can't just have one character. I got to make her a, um, a nemesis or I got to make her an arch rival. And that's where Endora came from. And as I thought about it more and more, I'm like, damn it, anime, I'm just going to have to write a new story. <laughs> but um, but I, I told myself, I said, anime, this is going to be a one and done. And then fast forward uh, six months later, and I'm sitting here planning the sequel to the story that chapter one ain't been even been read yet. But the Lord ain't through with me, y'all. Uh, I'm a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, as I began to go through the task of developing it, I did want to give it more of a magical fantasy feel. Since Bond of the Blade is, like you said, so physical, so martial arts. It's just martial arts um with powers <laughs> i also i kind of get did the reverse for the spider circle where they're mages and they're using spells but the way they use the spells often they weave hand-to-hand -hand combat in there as well oh. so but there's but they're definitely the focus is not just them with say like physical martial arts it's definitely more um physical infused spell casting yeah um, I believe I believe I believe the old D and D rule set would say that it's spell it spells with um, somatic components. There you go. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure how you're familiar you are with the minutia when it comes when it comes to D and D, but a lot of spells have one, tend to have one or have one of three types of components, and sometimes more than ones. You have um, material, self-explanatory, um, verbal, so can't cast it, can't cast it if you can't talk. And mm -hmm. some and somatic. You need to be able to. You need to be able to move. Yeah. Um, and most. Yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head. Give. Um. Given that. Given that kind of thing. Since you meant. Since you mentioned needing to needing to move. When it comes. When it comes to spell casting. Um. I'll. I'll address the elephant in the room. Was Avatar an influence? Where you have got that idea from, Mildred? I mean, uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, I did watch Avatar f from front to back when it debuted, when it dropped on Netflix again. Um, and I did also kind of watch Core about halfway through. But no, no, Avatar, no, none of that. No influence there at all. <laughs> Eric saw it. I'm offended that you didn't bring that. Well, I... <laughs> it is at this point that I, f I feel like I feel I need I feel I need I need to I need to mention one of my one of my disclo one of my disclosures that's it, that's in that's in the that's in the scroll of the monk. Um, mm -hmm. We here at the we here at the monastery apologize to anyone that we that we ha that we have not offended yet. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to you. We will get to you. All right, you sit tight. <laughs> I see you back there in the back talking mm -hmm. about. Oh, you ain't talking about me. Well, don't worry. We will be next time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. But in all all seriousness, um, I I really do appreciate the um, the universe that the guys at the um, at the Avatar world built, mm -hmm. and their take on uh, chi and um magic. What was the word? Magical systems. Mm -hmm was so original i had never seen anything like it when i first saw the last airbender and as someone who usually goes more to the the realm of physical characters that appealed to me so much so i thought of i sort of just said in the back of my mind like yo if i ever do some shit with mages it's definitely gonna be more like avatar and less like harry potter because i like harry potter 
Don't get me wrong, but if you just sit me down and say anime and you have to make Spider Circle like Harry Potter, we just won't have Spider Circle because yeah. that's that's a different story now. Um, and it's I, a little, yeah. Go ahead. Well, while well, I had while well, I had been expo- well, I had been exposed to di- to different types for the, for the longest time, I cr- I bring up th- I bring up that one particularly because I think for a whole generation that presented the idea of not having not having um stationary style magic users um yeah you know the mo- obvious obviously obviously a lot of people are going to th- going to think of the t- the typical wizard in a wizard in a tower kind of um approach you know mm-hmm. wizard in a t- wizard in a tower big big hat not good not good with dealing with people um yeah. tends to <laughs> tends to tends to utilize tends to utilize spells at range because th- because they're squishy um, exactly. <laughs> but, Shout out to my mobile people. <laughs> um, but the, but I've all I've always told people that there's that there's mul- that there's that um, the t- that the typical wizard approach is does not need to be the approach that you make with your um, caster. And depending yeah. depending on the depending on the type of the type of approach, it would it wouldn't make any sense. Like I've always I've always laughed at the idea of of um d- of say. A more a more a more dwarfy style wizard um, using magic the same using magic this in that traditional approach. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever whenever I've had dwarves in any of my fantasy campaigns, I always have it that you don't you don't use you don't use that you don't use that wave in your hand shit. No you no you put you put spells in the fucking runes because they <laughs> because they may not be as flashy but they work. <laughs> yeah man you look man you 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 gotta you got to do what you gotta do when you out here doing it. especially when you're in these magic streets mm-hmm. look we ain't sometimes you can't be over here all this waving or or incantation and no 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 man. Look, there's there's like you said there's too many different styles of magic mm-hmm. and ways to execute magic to have it everything be merlin with the with the long pointy dunce cap and the beard down to his feet. Truth Sometimes, be- mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, truth be told, um, more often than not, a lot of the casters that I end up ta- that I end up taking influence from, or, mm-hmm. or that I end up using as bases when I when I do casting based characters in games, um, is more it has more in co- has more in common with say um, a say a own Miyunji, um, because. I, because I because I was way I was way too young to be reading the Otogi Zoshi, so <laughs> so instead 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 of having a spell book, they just ha- they just have a bunch of ta- they just have a bunch of talismans that they'll throw out that'll do the spells for them. Now you know what I have no idea what name you said for that book, but I do know, and this is me showing my pleb here. I do remember seeing in like the Jackie Chan adventures and shit. They use all the talismans all the time. So definitely I'm I'm seeing what you're referencing, even though I have no idea what book you're talking um, about. Otogi Zoshi is is a bit is a bit of a classical bit of um of Japanese fiction. It literally translates to fairy tales. It's a it's a collection of sto- it's a collection of fantastical stories. Um some people, some people have made allusion. Some people have said it's the Japanese equivalent of, say, the Brothers Grimm, mm-hmm. in in the sense of just be instead of one singular story, just being a collection. Um, yeah, and and Onmyunji is is um not too far removed from a from a Dao, from a Taoist priest. Um, the whole the the whole the whole idea with with them is again utilizing talismans, and instead of instead of being um, often, often some tower covered covered in tomes. Um, more often than not, they more often than not they had a um, respected position in um, in imperial in imperial or local courts. But mm-hmm. oftentimes, usually with things like usually with things like divining, because everybody wants to know what's gonna happen. Um, right. <laughs> but it but it but it has it would be more akin to a more civilized kind of. Kind of sh- kind of shamanism. <clears throat> you know, and... ran- random point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also just just a slight um observation I've made. Mm-hmm. Um, because I I do notice how the the difference between the way a lot of Eastern cultures and more Western cultures deal with people who practiced magic. 
I see when you think of a lot of stuff in Western, you think of like you were saying, like the the the, the old the anti-social wizard mm-hmm. or the uh, the 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 witch who, who's just uh just just persecuted and they just everyone just wants to find her to kill her yeah. and for the most part i see that a lot in a lot of uh more european or european uh born cultures and then that's so much different from what i keep hearing about uh magic practitioners from the east where they were actually very respected and sought after in a lot of their um traditional stories and, and folklore that's i just thought that's real yeah. interesting when it when it comes to your when it comes to europe it's it's largely it's largely an effect of um of 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 of, of storytelling in, in a post-christianization kind of kind of setup mm-hmm. um yeah and it's and if and if you look at stuff that's that's trying that's trying to lean a bit more a bit more into the neo-pagan movement that's that started up a few decades ago um mm-hmm. there the the position of the position of say a shaman or a or a or a scald or something or something like that is significantly more sought after and of, co- and of yeah. course in um of course in, of course there in in other in other in other cultures there's the, there's the there's the equivalents um cuz there's cuz you you look at it in a lot of cases you always have somebody who somebody who leads and somebody who's the um, spiritual guide in a lot in a lot of in a lot of settings and the like, um, but I do I do want to address a bit a large elephant in the room that I can that I'm kind of obligated to touch on, given Go that right given that the spider's circle is a ma- is very magical themed. Um, mm-hmm. When you were when you were con- when you were concepting it, um, did you en- did you end up put did you end up making a bit of a primer on how your magic system works? Um, funny enough, the the developing of how magic works mm-hmm. in the spider circle is something that that most likely was and continues to be my greatest um, source of pride and struggle <laughs> because <laughs> as someone who's never been the biggest fan of magical things or things that are like high fantasy i guess you could say Mm -hmm. trying to develop a magical system that is both believable enough that it makes sense but fantastical enough that it keeps people it it adds more of a sense of wonder to the to the to the story Mm -hmm. is definitely something that um i am not familiar with um which is part of the reason why bond of the blade is in chapter two of its mini arc and we still ain't seen the prologue pages for the spider circle mm-hmm. um yeah it's it's definitely not my my given wheelhouse um it's something that i is still being worked on to this day i'm going to be completely 100 percent honest with you um so i can't really go too deep into detail about that mm-hmm. um i promise as well, that long before the the story proper starts, it will be well fleshed out, and hopefully the next time I come on, I can have more of a concrete answer for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I respect you as a um a fellow creative and a fellow person who be in these these bird app trenches, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't want to disrespect the temple and sit here and bullshit an answer for you <laughs> that I'm still figuring out. I'm not gonna do that to you. I'm not gonna do that to any potential readers. Oh. So. It's interesting that you bring up um, uh, the sense of the sense of wonder aspect, since I can easily see that being a bit of a challenge to be able to get be able to get that kind of thing across in a mo- in a more contemporary setting. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's easy it's easy to ha- it's easy to present a set a sense of wonder when you're de- when you're dealing with a more a more cla- a more classical or even antiquity kind of era because people didn't people didn't get around much. They they were still they were still you still have people who were ve- who were very insular. You still had the Im- the bigger importance of the city state instead of the state, um, mm-hmm. and of course, you- of course, there's the old adage of he- of here there be dra- here there be dragons, where people imagined <laughs> yeah. all different all different kinds of monsters that were out in out in the um, wilderness, um, mm-hmm. or so- or some or some worse things if you're dealing with forests in Eastern Europe. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
if I were if I were to do a drinking game of the of the number of, of the number of Eastern European fairy tales that, I, that I've heard that that de that deal with something happening in the forest, I'd probably be dead. <laughs> it's drink your ass to death. Yeah, I'd probably be dead, or I'd or I'd end up causing a liquor shortage in three states, and then I'd be dead anyways. <laughs> so either way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either either way, I'm either way I'm screwed. Yeah, man. <laughs> Rest in peace. But and I, and when it but with a with a lot of these kind of with a lot of the, these kind of setups, the um a common a common thread that's that's often seen is the is the world of the magic is the is still present, but it's but for one reason or another, depending on the story, it's hidden from the from the eyes of everyday people is that without spoiling too much is that the approach that you decided to go with yes and no um i swear to god the answer the, the whole title to this episode could just be yes and no i feel like <laughs> i've said it eighty thousand times but uh in a sense the the spider circle takes place in a fictionalized version of the united states in the 1960s mm -hmm. um and the setting is um, a place called Arclight City, and it is essentially um, a magical haven slash magical capital that exists in a world um, that, for different reasons, has uh, begun to draw away from using magic openly, and they're going more on the realm of a strictly natural technological society. Mm -hmm. And... Arclight City is one of the last places in the world where uh, people can practice magic openly and where it's just a part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So for the rest of the United States, it would be like something that's hidden, that's off on its own thing. But to them, it's just everyday shit. Mm -hmm. And it's more about how different uh, magic users uh, execute their particular spell casting art, what they do with it. Um, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's almost like um, how Full Metal Alchemist was like, okay, that's not Europe, and we can definitely see that this is supposed to be Europe back in the early 1900s. But um, alchemy is a thing, mm -hmm. so instead of it being a uh, a purely technological advancement, it's a alchemy driven society. That mm -hmm. that type of feel. Or even since you brought up Avatar, kind of like that, where for that, for that world, it's a fictionalized version of our world, and in this little part, you know, for for the Spider Circle, magic is a thing. But if someone who didn't live there walked in there, they would be just completely blown away with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, that pr with with that kind of thing in mind, you um. When we talked when we talked about the set the setting of Bond of the Blade, the, um, U um, Union City, you had met you had mentioned a lot of that was dr was drawing up was drawing upon places places that you had lived. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to when it comes to this when it comes to the setting of the Spider Circle, is it is it a similar is it a similar thing or or were, or did you try and go did you try and go um, for a bit off a bit off the proverbial beaten path in this case? Oh, it's definitely off the beaten path. Um, first of all, I'm I'm calling from a lot of things that I know slash research about um, the 60s and 70s, um, having to do a lot of research on uh, different um, styles, different ways that buildings looked. And I know a little bit, like... I know that if you go back to the earlier 1900s, you're going to see a lot of Art Deco stuff everywhere. And depending on which decade you're in, the cars are going to be more shaped like this. But I really had to dive in deep and um, immerse myself in these these different cultures, many, for the most part, that don't even look like that anymore, to try and create something that was slightly familiar looking, but something that could also be you know, completely brand new. And I'm I'm not done with that yet either. I'm going to go in and look up different um inspirations from different cultures as well because I don't want it I don't want it necessarily to be one hundred percent Americana because there's no reason for it to be. It's literally the magical capital of 
the free world. Um, there's no reason why I have to have it make it look like 1960s New York or whatever. So I definitely want to flex some of my creative um, setting muscles when it comes to that. So don't be surprised when you see more of the setting of, uh, of the spider circle that you're like, huh, I didn't expect that. Well, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I didn't expect that neither until I looked it up and like, yeah, this would fit. And, and I kind of retooled it for the story, mm -hmm. you know. But since since you mentioned this, since you mentioned this place being the magical capital of the free world, I get. Would it be correct of me to to say that there's that it has a very cosmopolitan melting pot kind of vibe? Uh, yeah, most most definitely. I think I'm I'm definitely sensing, um, as I craft the setting for this story, definitely more of a um more of a metropolitan sort of like a, a bustling city. With you know different inspirations from cultures and just magic shit everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely has that 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 feel to it. Yeah, but e even with it, even within that, there there's I'd imagine that there's a bit that there's a significant mix of di of different subcultures all th all throughout the place. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, my bad. I'm showing my plebness again. I was thinking more like big city, not like mixing people. My mm -hmm. fault. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, that that's also true. And it's funny um, how you um, went to that, because when I think of uh, the cast of the Spider Circle, whether we're talking about the, the actual coven mates themselves or their, their friends, their mentors, even their enemies, there are all these different subcultures and little sub sort of representations in there. Because the way I have a lot of this, the um, society built up is around the the idea of different covens and how a coven in my world is like one part social group, one part um, cultural movement within itself. Uh, you have some gangs that are like, I mean, you have some covens that are like gangs. Those are the rogue covens where they're, they're operating completely outside the law. You have ones who are technically legal, but they kind of are off doing their own thing. They don't really have a great um, relationship with the law. And you have ones that are more legitimized legally. And each coven and different covens of different types, they all have their own aesthetics. They have their own, um, the way that they cast spells even. Uh, and all that mixes together to make this just nice little, this little pot, this little stew of different cultural experiences like there's there's covens that are are nomadic there's covens that look like uh, almost like 19 uh, prohibition era gangsters which is why endora gets her look from uh, largely and just all those different things and then i also drew a lot from just existing uh stuff like um uh greasers um hippie stuff like that you know from from those different eras and like I said, I'm just I'm just trying to make something that that feels familiar, but it still has its own sense of originality to it. But yes, there's a lot of different aspects of cultural and even racial in there. I mean, you look at my, my freaking cast list for for the Spider Circle, damn near look like Burger King Kids Club. And yeah, it's it's mainly black folks, but like there's really not a big sense of like racial. Um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of here? Like it, it's not. You're go not ahead. going full excellence. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. Oh. Oh. Please no. Please no. Please no. 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 Not in my house. No. 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 Yeah. No. Um. And what I what I do when you meant when you mentioned all these different um groups that that are based that are based on different themes i i will admit one um one thing that instantly came to mind and th and for some people this is going to be a deep cut for other people this for other people this is going to be a low blow but have you ever seen the f the film the warriors warriors <laughs> come out and play it. <laughs> and how was with that kind of with that kind of film? All of the gangs were um were working on some kind of gimmick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even if the even if the gimmick was was ridiculous in some in some cases, like <laughs> like a bunch yeah. a bunch of guys a bunch of guys trying to trying to dress up like like old school Yankees. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
No, of, co of course, of course, si of course, Cyrus go going out there, look, going out there, looking like a preacher, which, uh, for all intents and purposes, he may as well have been. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. But, I've but the reason I, the reason I bring up I bring up that kind of thing is it kind of it kind of goes in it kind of goes into that um, cosmopolitan nature that I, that I was bringing up. You have all these yeah. different cultures and subcultures that have moved to the, to this one to this one city, and um, fr obviously friction is going to be inevitable. Oh yes, oh. there is friction aplenty. Is some pe some people like some people like each other. Some people can't stand each other, and some and some people would rather throw you than know you. Uh, mm, okay, like let, let, let's talk about it. Okay, <laughs> real shit. Mm -hmm. But no, that's 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 actually a very very good observation, and you you drew a very good parallel there. I love anyone who references the Warriors mm -hmm. because yes, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, there there is sort of that vibe of all these. These groups coexisting together, some by choice, some by force, um, and most of them don't. I mean, there are some that I that I are that I are. Good lord, <laughs> that I am making a bit more gimmicky. But the ones that we focus on, um, even if there is a theme, excuse me, mm -hmm. that that's um, represented a bit in in the way they dress or the way they do stuff, it's for uh, reasons that are are deeper they're not just skin deep you know like there's there's reasons why they have these names or they wear these clothes or you know what have you mm -hmm. um but yeah there there's definitely that sense of you know you you know you in the hammerheads part of town because this that and the third mm -hmm. and if you go over there don't even go over there because that's kraken's territory and they'll just kill you because they just because they're bored you know don't even go over there but you, Definitely had have that thing going on. Yeah, and with with any with any with any well with any well developed um sit, city set city setting in that in that kind of regard, you're inevitably gonna have factions. You see, which is why you, which is why you see faction systems so much in um in strategy games, and 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 some sim games. Like I was I was thinking of um say Star Sector because I because I've been dip I've been dipping in that off and on for years. And how mm -hmm. you and how you have all these diff all these different factions who you who um you can either work with or have them play against each other depending on how how devious you want to be, <laughs> or right and, right or in, or in some cases or in some cases just um just pay just pay just pay somebody to shoot them because no because nobody likes the Luddic path, and the Luddic mm -hmm. path doesn't like anybody. Um no. Um, yeah, definitely. You you bringing that up makes me think of um, Skyrim to an extent. And while that, I'm sure that much, that's much more of a, a pleb example. Um, it I definitely remember the the whole thing of Am I going to be on Stormcloak? Am I going to be you know? It's just, it's, just it, it's human nature to form groups, mm -hmm. and then within those groups there are other groups, mm -hmm. and so it's it's very. It's it's a trope that exists for a reason, and it's one that I think is you know can often be done very very well and is very useful, you know. Yeah. Now, with that with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'm I'm aware I'm aware that the that um, episode six of the bon of the Bond of the Blade mini arc is on, is on the coming soon end of, end of the end of the spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for that? Um, well, Tapas, uh, that this this current chapter, uh, the way Tapas works is mm -hmm. the, the, their phrasing is kind of weird, but I'm I'm trying to get used to it. Every little collection of uh, things that you upload at a time is called an episode. Mm -hmm. And now the way I'm scripting it, I'm doing by chapter, so. Each chapter for this little mini arc we're doing is ten pages long. Mm -hmm. So when we're, we're in the middle of chapter two, and the next one that's coming out is episode six, within these chapters that's that's coming out. But um, this chapter that we're in right now focuses on the character Michaela, um, who's also known as Chant. Uh, that's her. I guess you could say her code name or her hero name. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's uh facing off against 
uh, her who's someone who's actually her nemesis on the streets, a girl by the name of uh, Stinger. And you'll learn a lot about them and why they're on opposite sides um, in the story proper. But it's just safe to say now uh, they have a history and it's not very pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, they have enough respect for each other not to kill each other, but beyond that, it's it's it, it's it's complicated. It's very complicated. But each each chapter sort of deals with a different member of the heretics, uh, how they fight, um, their personality, and sort of something internal that they struggle with. Mm-hmm. And without spoiling anything for the upcoming episodes, I can tell you that Michaela's thing is just. She is a perfectionist. She's one of those characters where she needs things to be a certain way. And she'll be the type of person where if she's studying martial arts, she will practice one kick for five years until she gets it the way she feels like it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be very good, obviously, you know, getting straight A's in school and being very precise. But if you lock yourself into doing things a certain way, once you have to go off that, it's going to be a struggle. And that's exactly why the thing that's happening to her right now is happening because she's so used to fighting like this, um, being like this. And so once she's out of her element, she's kind of floundering out here. Mm-hmm. So that, I guess you could say that's, um, that's, that's what you, that's what y'all can look forward to in this current chapter of Bond of the Blade. Y'all get some, y'all get some, some Mickey action, you know, and, and she's, she's, Forming a nice little fan club for. I got some people. Uh, Hero geek, love him some Mickey. Like he'll sing her praises till the end of the day. Mm-hmm. He just loves her so much, man. Yeah. But with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up here to the temple. Mm. Hey, man. Look, w- whatever it takes for me to sit down with dope ass individuals like yourself, man. I I can't wait to be on again. Mm-hmm. Like I I really feel I love these conversations, man. You you got this this weird energy about you. That's just like, come sit with me, talk nerd things, bullshit. Let's do it. And yeah. I'm like, yes, keep keep the drinks coming so we can keep the nerdery going. I I need to come. I can't wait to come back to this mm-hmm. temple, man. Yeah. Um, and of course, any, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often That's say around up. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, it looks like that little um, that <laughs> little drink I had with uh with, with dinner, it suited me just fine. <laughs> and of course, yes. a and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>